This is Free Speech Radio News for Monday, September 3rd, 2012. In Los Angeles, I'm Dorian Marina. Today, we bring you a special Labor Day documentary, From Crisis to Cooperatives, Lessons from Argentina's Cartoneros. It's the story of workers turning economic hardship into opportunity after one of South America's most devastating economic crashes. Please stay tuned. Over the last few years, Europe has experienced a severe financial crisis, with countries like Greece and Spain facing skyrocketing debt and unemployment. More than a decade ago, a similar situation was unfolding in Argentina. In 2001, the country suffered a debilitating economic crisis and, as a result, defaulted on its foreign debt and stopped pegging the Argentine peso to the U.S. dollar. When the peso-to-dollar conversion jumped suddenly to 3 to 1, many Argentines lost two-thirds of their savings overnight. Banks closed, companies went out of business, and fully one-quarter of the population was left without work. Tens of thousands of those people in desperation started to make their living from garbage. Working as cartoneros, which means cardboard people, they sorted through trash to find recyclable materials to sell. Thus was born Buenos Aires' informal recycling system, which still exists today. Eilish O'Neill has more on how the cartoneros, who originally struggled to exist on what they could make on their own, eventually organized into cooperatives in order to help each other and to demand that the government support their efforts. Cartoneros are a common sight in Buenos Aires. Dressed in weatherproof clothing with broad, reflective stripes, they walk down the streets pushing or pulling carts as wide as cars. Early in the evening, these carts are empty. But as the night goes on, cartoneros sort through the trash bags that the city's residents leave out on the curbs, and they fill their carts with the recyclable material they find. Cartoneros work long hours, often 12 or 13 a day, six or seven days a week, and they make very little. They're paid by the kilo for the recyclable material that they gather, says Valentina Herrera, the president of one cartoneros cooperative. For good white paper, they pay us one peso, or at the upper end, one peso 20 cents. Cartoneros try to gather paper. It's worth a little more. Metals, copper, bronze are worth a little. A lot more, but there's very little to be found. There always are newspapers and cardboard, which is what cartoneros look for to sell regularly. Then there's plastic and other materials. Herrera started this work in 2001 after he lost his job as a truck driver. He started to gather trash in the street, and in order to make ends meet, he eventually had to bring his wife and kids along too. Herrera and the others who began working as cartoneros during the Argentine economic crisis of 2001 eventually organized themselves into cooperatives, and their experiences can serve as a lesson for survival during times of economic contraction and severe unemployment. The 2001 economic crisis touched almost everyone in Argentina and led to a period of major social upheaval. Matias Tarando is an engineer who currently works for a cartonero cooperative. It was a disaster. There was a lot of unemployment, a lot of people on the streets without work. Yes, I remember. It was a disaster. They fired my father. He worked for a company for 30 years, and they fired him. One in four Argentines, that's nine million people, lost their jobs in 2001. Pablo Uper, a historian who specializes in modern Argentine social and economic history, says that if you count the underemployed, the picture's even bleaker. If you count the underemployed, who were the people that worked odd jobs a few hours a week, the unemployment reached 41, 42 percent. 
So we're talking about a situation in which half the population is excluded from stability, is excluded from the market. A number of factors caused Argentina's 2001 economic crisis. In 1991, the government had implemented a policy called convertibility, which pegged the Argentine peso to the U.S. dollar. The measure was intended to fight Argentina's runaway inflation, and it did that successfully. But it also meant that the country couldn't print money to pay its expenses. As a result, says economist Nicolás Kachanowski, the government borrowed money from international organizations such as the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. Finalmente ya... Finally, the international institution said, we're not going to lend you more money. Argentina couldn't print pesos because the reforms which pegged the peso to the dollar. 2001 was the end of the cycle. We were bankrupt and had two options, either reducing costs, since we couldn't increase our income, or leaving the monetary system. And that's what we did. When Argentina dropped its convertibility policy in January 2002, its foreign debt, which it owed in dollars, suddenly tripled. Instead of owing one peso for every dollar owed in foreign debt markets, the government owed three pesos. Suddenly, the country's foreign debt, already large because of the 1970s military government's deficit spending, was 130 percent of its gross domestic product. And not only the government had debts in dollars, banks and companies did as well, says Kachanowski. That led to a crisis situation for the whole financial system, for companies. People were withdrawing their money from the banks, which practically collapsed until they had to close and say, we don't have the money, we're going bankrupt. And that was, let's say, the most difficult point in the crisis, the people protesting against the banks, when the banks said, we don't have your money. Banks placed limits on the amounts clients could withdraw from their accounts. Argentines were forced to stand by and watch as their personal savings lost value along with the national currency. Protests erupted and President Fernando de la Rua was forced to resign. After a quick succession of two more presidents, one of whom decided to default on Argentina's foreign debt, President Eduardo Dualde finally came to power and started to solve the problem by returning to a floating currency. Economist Kachanowski says that today, Greece is in a similar situation. There's an important similarity. That is, if I can't print the currency in which I pay off my loans, I have to be careful to balance my accounts, same as with a family or with a company. I can't spend more than I make. Eventually, I'll hit a wall. Greece now faces a similar dilemma. Increasing income is difficult. I have to reduce my costs. Countries don't usually want to reduce their costs. And so what options remain? Leaving the monetary union. However, Kachanowski points out that defaulting and returning to a floating national currency in Greece and Spain would be more complex than it was in Argentina due to the many partners and conditions involved in the Eurozone. As in Argentina in 2001, unemployment in Greece now stands at close to 25 percent of the population, and youth unemployment is over 50 percent. Those numbers only count people who are actively looking for work. Others have given up. In Argentina, the newly unemployed found various means of survival. Some of them took over abandoned factories and started worker-run operations. Others organized as piqueteros and cut off major streets during rush hour to get the government to listen to their demands for food and unemployment benefits. Still others established neighborhood assemblies that helped each other in whatever ways possible. Pablo Casal remembers the first assembly meeting that he attended in his neighborhood of San Martín, a middle-class Buenos Aires suburb. There were a lot of people who spoke about what was happening to them. I remember that there were people who cried, who had their savings in the bank. There were people that put forward the political program of whatever party. There was, you know, a diversity of voices. At first glance, the assemblies were very chaotic, says historian Pablo Uper. But the fact that people that had lost their point of social contact had a way to meet with others was not chaos. It was the possibility of meeting with others. Many times, the assemblies organized job exchanges. They organized snack times so that the children would have after-school snacks. They organized the cleaning of the neighborhood's plaza.
and the neighborhood assemblies also organized the Caserolazos, protests with pots and pans that descended on the nation's capital to protest the government's policies. There was a central neighborhood committee located in the city's Parque Centenario that coordinated the activities of the local groups. These assemblies tried to knit together a society that seemed about to fall apart. Hay que luchar, hay que luchar. 2010, la plataforma. You're listening to a special FSRN documentary, From Crisis to Cooperatives, Lessons from Argentina's Cartoneros, a look at how workers in Argentina turned economic hardship into opportunity. Produced by Eilish O'Neill, please stay tuned. When one quarter of the Argentine population found itself without work in 2001, tens of thousands of the newly unemployed became cartoneros, people that make their living by sorting through garbage and by selling the recyclable materials they find there. Maria Ramis has been a cartonera for over a decade. She used to work as a secretary in human resources for a private parcel service, but in 2001, that company went out of business. Yo me la pasaba mandando currículums. I spent my time sending resumes, going out to look for work, but at the age of 44, that is to say, I looked for any work, waiter, office assistant, whatever. Either I was overqualified, and even though I told them, but it's not a problem if I'm overqualified, I'll do this work anyway. In one of the neighborhood assemblies that formed throughout Argentina after 2001, Ramis found her new work as a cartonera. In the neighborhood assembly, there was one person who worked in a paper factory, and this person said, well, go out. Not just me, but also other neighbors in the same situation. Go out and gather paper, cardboard, newspapers, and afterwards the factory where I work will buy them. The transition from a 9 to 5 office job to working in the street sorting garbage isn't an easy one. Rami says. On a personal level, it was very hard. I cried. I cried a lot. Because it's a lot of hours a day. It's not the world's most pleasant work. But it was that or nothing. Maria Ramis isn't the only person who fell from the middle class into unemployment and desperation, says historian Pablo Uper. Hay testimonios de cartoneros que contaban. Hasta ahora, los de la clase media me miraban mal. Uper says that in 2001, members of the middle class who had previously looked down on or insulted cartoneros became cartoneros. The known was exempt from losing their work and stability. With the dramatic devaluation of the peso, even those who had money saved in banks found that those savings lost most of their value. One cartoneros cooperative, El Cebo, named after Argentina's national tree, had formed in 1989 and tried to help the newly unemployed. Cristina Lescano is the cooperative's president. They were middle-class people. We gave out food at that time. I will never forget the shame on the faces of those people when they had to ask us for food or for work. Those who found work with Lescano were the lucky ones because those who started out on their own, such as Maria Ramis and her neighbors, earned barely enough to survive. If you want to more or less make a living, you can't work fewer than 12 hours a day. 
At first, we made enough money to make it through the day and to have our expenses more or less covered. After two or three years, I started taking Sundays off before I worked seven days a week, seven days a week. Ramis decided that she would do better if she networked and organized. She started by talking to companies, asking them to sort their recycling from their trash and telling them when she would come by to pick up the former. I had written my name, my contact info on a piece of paper, and with that paper I visited businesses. I tried to contact some of the factories in my neighborhood so that they would know. It's not just anyone that comes to pick up the cardboard. I come on such and such a day at such and such a time. Eventually, Ramis helped her neighbors organize into a cooperative, a group of cartoneros who pool their resources. It's essentially a worker-run company. Most cooperatives have a president and a secretary who supervise the workers and attend meetings with the government and with NGOs interested in helping cartoneros. Though they aim to turn a profit, most of these cooperatives call themselves social companies because they employ those who would not otherwise find employment and because they help their members when necessary. Historian Pablo Uper says that cartoneros derived many benefits from organizing into groups. El hecho es que el cartonero solo tiene menos poder de the fact is that a cartonero working alone has less negotiating power and less ability to carry the garbage that he or she finds. Sometimes a cartonero finds an old washing machine, and that means that he has to go back right away. Sharing loads in the most literal sense is something enabled by working together. After organizing unofficially on the neighborhood level, Maria Ramis and the others in the Western Cooperative learned, through the same neighborhood assembly that had given them the idea to become cartoneros in the first place, how to incorporate officially and become a company. They did so through the Credit Co-op Bank, an Argentine bank that specializes in helping fund cooperatives of all kinds. They also started to bring their demands to the local, provincial, and national governments. Historian Pablo Uper says that politicians couldn't afford to ignore those demands. The government needs the cartoneros to organize themselves because, if they don't, it could lead to social disorder, either crime or riots. Neither of those is good for a government. The government thus began to formally recognize cartoneros' cooperatives. It changed the law so that digging through trash was no longer illegal. And it organized vaccination drives. Sorting through garbage isn't particularly sanitary and it provided uniforms with reflective stripes so that cartoneros wouldn't get run over by cars while wheeling their carts through traffic or standing in the street to sort through trash. Some cooperatives even receive government subsidies. The cartoneros who belong to those cooperatives get an additional 1,000 pesos, that's a little more than $200, every month that they work at least three days a week and leave the trash bags tidy on the curb. In the mid-2000s, the government of Buenos Aires took an additional step to help cartoneros. It required that each of the companies that buy recyclable materials establish Centros Verdes, green centers, for sorting paper, plastic, cardboard, and metals. At that time, the Buenos Aires city government launched a small fleet of trucks to pick up recyclables from hospitals, large office buildings, and other places deemed major waste generators. That material is delivered to the Centros Verdes, where cartoneros cooperatives sort it and then sell it to recycling plants. The government assigned Maria Ramis's cooperative to one of these Centros Verdes in late 2007. This Centro Verde is in Villa Soldati, an impoverished, isolated part of the city of Buenos Aires. Inside, piles of recyclable materials approach the ceiling of a big, one-room, windowless warehouse. Today, it's been raining and the dirt yard is flooded. Someone's placed a row of cardboard boxes as stepping stones across the enormous puddle in front of the separate building, also unheated, that serves as the offices of the cooperative's presidents. A pack of dogs barks at everyone who comes through the heavy front gate. Despite the rain and the cold, cartoneros are sitting on makeshift chairs and sorting through recycling in the uncovered yard. Jorge Horacio Pilecho has worked at the Centro Verde since 2001, when he lost his job as an administrative assistant. 
I'm recycling the material that comes in, separating white paper, used paper, cardboard, scrap metal, aluminum or metal, newspapers, and that's it. Due to government subsidies and more stable work conditions, cartoneros who work here make a lot more than those who work on the street. Workers in a Centro Verde can make more than 2,000 pesos a month, or more than $400, while cartoneros on the street make less than $300 a month. Without government assistance, only by selling the recyclable materials that they gathered, the El Sebo Cooperative managed to build its own sorting warehouse. They started small, in a relatively tiny building without electricity, gas or plumbing. But in 2006, they moved into the larger plant where they currently operate. Each day, they bring in and sort 11 tons of recyclable materials. Eight tons come from their own network of schools, companies and individuals who separate their recycling for the cooperative to pick up while the city of Buenos Aires delivers three tons of materials from hospitals, office buildings, and other large waste generators. Toda esta montaña es todo material que viene eh, con la logística nuestra propia. Digamos. Esto es, viene de escuelas, de colegios, de, de empresas, de consorcios, de particulares también, que viene con el camión, que lo pasamos a retirar con la logística de IGE semanal, Matias Tarando is an engineer who's worked for the El Cebo Cooperative for the past six months, helping with projects such as an initiative to build finished products from recycling. He describes the mountain of recyclable material, all mixed together, that the cartoneros sort. Paper, cardboard, film and plastic. The material falls onto a belt, on either side of which stand a line of cartoneros. And El Cebo does more than just sort and repurpose recycling, Tarando points out. The cooperative also plays an important social role. The idea is to get these people off the street, out of the environment of ripping trash bags in the street, and give them here more dignified work in more sanitary conditions. El Cebo also gives work to former prisoners who don't have other employment opportunities. In fact, both El Cebo and the Western Cooperative describe themselves as social companies, companies that want to make money, but that take care of their employees. Maria Ramis of the Western Cooperative says this includes understanding employees' needs. Bring your kids, bring them, because you don't have anywhere to leave them. I need money because my mother is sick. All right, that's fine. We'll lend it to you. Though Cartoneros cooperatives do their best, it hasn't all been smooth sailing, says El Cebo engineer Matias Tarando. Issues arise because their employees live unstable lives and, in the case of the El Cebo cooperative, often come from disadvantaged backgrounds. As a result, they aren't always able to be reliable workers. The other difficult part is taking them off the street and teaching them how to respect a schedule and how to have a job, let's say. That's a complete change. It's not overnight. It's a process that, let's say, has its ups and downs. And also, let's say, the staff isn't consistent. It changes because these are people that have their problems, let's say. And there are structural difficulties as well. There are only a handful of companies in Buenos Aires that buy the recyclable materials that cartoneros collect. Valentina Herrera, president of the Villa Soldati Cooperative, says that those companies fix the prices that they pay for each product brought to them. Right now, big multinational companies control the prices, and in January, February, and March, they lowered them terribly. They lowered them to whatever prices they want. So we're still slaves. We're still tied to that. The state hasn't written good legislation yet, hasn't named a base price that the companies can't change. Herrera isn't the only cartonero who hopes that the national government will start fixing prices so that companies pay a little more for the materials they buy. In fact, most of the cartoneros' demands focus on the need for a centralized, organized recycling system in Argentina. And they're hoping that, within that system, they'll be employed as workers with benefits. 
Engineer Matias Tarando of the El Sebo Cooperative says that the reason that a better recycling system hasn't already been set up is that the Buenos Aires government has ties to Seamse, the company that picks up the city's trash and transports it to landfills in the province. El gobierno, eh, que no, no le que... The government doesn't want the Cartonero system to work. Why not? Because garbage is a business venture here. Siamse charges $65 for every ton of trash it buries, and also charges for each ton of trash it transports. So it's a business model. All of the material that doesn't go to Siamse, that doesn't get buried because it's recycled here, is money that they are losing. We want there to be a smoothly functioning recycling system. We'll have to see if the government wants one. Though it's not clear exactly what the ties between the city government and the garbage collection agency are, it is notable that Buenos Aires Mayor Mauricio Macri has requested several budget increases for the garbage company. At the same time, he's done little to nothing to comply with the city's zero garbage law, which demands that the government create a functioning recycling system. Maria Ramis, the secretary of the Western Cooperative, says that as an important first step, the government should launch a public education campaign to teach Argentines to separate recyclable materials from trash. No hay una... There isn't serious education about sorting your trash. For example, the city government's most recent public service announcement having to do with trash showed a man putting his garbage bag on the curb. They say to him, Sir, why are you putting the garbage on the curb if there's a container down the street? But they don't say to him, Sir, sort your trash so it could be recycled. If you don't, there's going to come a time when we don't have a place to bring the trash. Besides, you're throwing money into the street, you're hurting the environment, and it is also a part of social inclusion. Recycling is work. The recycling is work is exactly what Argentina's cartoneros found in 2001. From their experiences of building an informal economy and of organizing themselves for greater strength, historian Pablo Uper says there's an important object lesson to draw. The most interesting thing is El sufrimiento o la, la victimización, la vulnerabilidad a la que estábamos expuestos por parte del mercado. The ability of unemployed Argentines to create work out of nothing and to organize themselves is more important than the hunger and vulnerability they experienced in 2001, says Uber. And he adds that Greeks could learn more from regular Argentines' creativity in expanding the market than from their government's decisions to default on public debt and return to a floating currency. En este sentido, me parece que in this sense, it seems to me that, more than looking for the right macroeconomic solutions for Greece, we need to pay attention, not to what the government is doing, but to what the people are doing. Today's documentary, From Crisis to Cooperatives, Lessons from Argentina's Cartoneros, was produced by Eilish O'Neill in Buenos Aires. Documentary editor is Shannon Young, technical production by Janine Eder. La Plataforma provided the music in this documentary. We'll be back with our regular newscast tomorrow. Thanks for listening. In Los Angeles, I'm Dorian Marina.